that said, we'd like to transition now to our four, first presenter. And we specifically chose Catherine Radica for a reason, because of her unique experience in these two areas. Since 2005, Catherine of Whittier Consulting Group has helped some of the world's leading companies uh, get their products to market faster. Uh, Catherine is the author of The Mastery of Innovation, a field guide to lean product development, which actually won the Shingo Prize back in 2014. Um, and so we've known Catherine for quite a yeah, while now. Yeah, quite a few years. So we're excited to have Catherine on. So Catherine, I don't know if you can hear us. Uh, yes, I can hear you just fine. Can you hear me? We sure can. Uh, great. So what we're not seeing, uh, I don't know if you had planned on turning your webcam on or not, but Yes, I will. Give me a second here. Yeah, we can see your slides. And there's your webcam. Yeah. And you're dialing, yeah, yeah. In yes. from, you're dialing in from France, is that correct? Yes, I am. I'm dialing in from a small town uh, in the French Alps where I have a client. Uh, so it's been a very nice place to have a client to be get to go to the French Alps once a month. Excellent. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, so, um, okay. So, over to you. All right, well, I will go ahead and get started. Uh, so uh, they already did a nice introduction to me. I did want to point out that I just released a second book last year uh, called The Shortest Distance Between You and Your New Product, uh, How Innovators Use Rapid Learning Cycles to, do their, to Get Their Best Ideas to Market Faster. And I want to talk a little bit about um, how I got from lean product development to rapid learning cycles, um, what that journey has been. Um, I've been working in the field of lean product development since 2002. Uh, prior to that, I was uh, working with agile software methods. And um, so rapid learning cycles has been for me a coming together of these two things. And the coming together has been around um, long, slow learning cycles. Um, the root cause of a lot of the problems of product development that you see there um, are uh, that our you know, we see things like, uh, you know, basically lateness, uh, things not getting to market when we expect them, um, products that don't sell the way we expect them to, a lot of cost overruns and warranty costs. Um, you know, these are all things that lead us to um, doubt ourselves in, in R&D, lead us to think that our R&D teams can't really help us deliver what we need from the business. And so what we're doing with um, rapid learning cycles is trying to address the root cause of a lot of these problems. So these are some of the things that come up when you do uh, some root cause analysis on, you know, what's happening in product development. You know, uh, the fact that <laughs> programs that should be killed um, cannot be killed, and so uh, your gates are not really gates. They, you know, they're more like, you know, where they're open gates, everything passes through. Uh, the fact that sometimes our systems force us to begin working with suppliers very late. We may have procurement organizations that won't even go looking for a supplier until we have a part that they, to work with them on. And, you know, um, an engineer that needs to understand supplier capabilities, that's a very late place to start when they're trying something new for the first time. Um, and you kind of look at all this bundle of things that we have here, and they kind of all have a common theme, which is that most product development processes are a long, slow learning cycle. Our process forces us to make decisions very early in development that don't get validated until very late in development. So for example, we have things like requirements freeze, um, and we may be freezing some of those requirements before our um, marketing team has a good handle on what the customer really needs. Uh, we may be making decisions about uh, issues of uh, ergonomics or about the user interface that we don't validate with our users until they actually see it much, much later in the process when it's very difficult to do again um, if they don't like what they see. And uh, customers are notorious about not really being able to give us a good understanding of what they need until they have something to react to. You, know, you give them something and then all of a sudden they can tell you all the stuff they didn't think about before. And so uh, the way that we've set up product development in many cases has actually um, created this problem. Uh, by forcing us to make decisions before we really know what we need to know. Um, and it's, it's, it's a problem, you know, as I said, because then we are making our decisions based on incomplete knowledge, and then we are revisiting those decisions um, 
you know, when we uncover that there are problems with those decisions. And so um, the opportunity here is rapid learning cycles. Um, what we do with rapid learning cycles is we pull learning forward um, and we push decisions later. Uh, we pull learning forward to uh, make sure that we're identifying and removing obstacles. You know, and this has been a theme in Lean for a very long time. Um, in Lean, we've had, uh, you know, back to Alan Ward's work in the early 2000s, you know, we had the idea that, you know, we needed to do learning first development. You know, learn first and then commit was something that Alan uh, liked to say. Um, you know, we, we've had this idea for a long time that if we could, um, you know, spend more time up front, and um, the research into Toyota shows that, that, that spending more time up front on learning was one of the things they did that helped make them more effective in, in delivering cars. Um, so this is an old idea in Lean, um, but a very challenging idea, an idea that a lot of organizations have had a lot of difficulty implementing. Um, now, from the Agile side of things, uh, we get the idea uh, that it's better to push decisions later. And this is counterintuitive. Um, I have people ask me all the time, well, if we know what we need to know to make a decision, shouldn't we just make that decision? Why would we wait? You know? um, and um, the reality is that sometimes it doesn't matter. Sometimes we can get efficiency by deciding things early. But many times, um, for those decisions that tend to lead to long, slow loopbacks, those very important decisions that we have, uh, it's better to make that decision at the last responsible moment to make that decision so that we preserve flexibility. Not just to give us more time to learn, although that's a benefit of it. When we delay a decision, we have more time to learn what we need to know to make it with confidence. But also to allow us to uh, uncover the unknown unknowns that would affect that decision. So that we can unwind that decision if we need to um, with much less hassle, much less risk, because we haven't made other commitments based on that decision. So, um, so this is the opportunity here and what we're doing with rapid learning cycles is we're pulling learning forward and pushing decisions later. You know, and by doing that, we're bringing you know, ideas together from lean and from agile. Uh, lean pulling learning forward and agile pushing decisions later. And then breaking up those long, slow learning cycles. You know, in lean, you know, we have this concept that we, we reduce our batch sizes, that that's a key way that we improve performance of any process. Well, this is one thing where product development is like any other process when we can take these big, huge things that we're trying to figure out and we can break them into smaller pieces, then we can ask uh, sharper questions. We can learn better about how our product development needs to take place. Uh, we can define better experiments that get more conclusive results. And we can learn a lot faster. Um, you know, if I have to design a part or build a whole system in order to learn something, then you know, it's going to take a long time and I'm going to have to do it fairly late in the process. But if I can really tease out what the most important questions are, and then I can figure out how to define an experiment to answer exactly that question without having to build a whole system or without having to, um, you know, to, to make a system prototype, then I'm going to be able to learn a lot faster. So that's one of the things that's going here, going on here as well, is we're breaking up those big learning cycles, big, big batch of learning, and making it much smaller. So rapid learning cycles accelerate development because we are surfacing problems faster by learning as much as possible, as early as possible. That also tends to surface the things that we can't do um, sooner and maintaining flexibility as long as possible. So one of the things I'd like you to notice in this picture that I'm showing you is that in the definition and concept phases, the learnings are very packed and, and closely together. And in fact, the team in these phases uh, spends almost all of their time learning, even if they don't call it that. Even if they're not doing learning cycles. They're spending a lot of time exploring different ideas and then capturing those ideas into the requirements documents, specification documents. And then as the program moves forward into design, into validation. The learning stretches out, starts taking more time to learn. The things they're learning are bigger. And, and then by the time you get to validation, it's a smaller part of what the team is doing. Mostly what they're doing by that time is they're executing the decisions they've already made. Uh, but they're still continuing to learn a little bit uh, because that's, that's one of the ways that we maintain uh, flexibility. 
And then uh, a key part of all of this is that we're capturing extensible knowledge along the way. You know, and knowledge capture is another thing. It's been part of the, the DNA of lean product development from the very beginning and even, you know, even further to the lean enterprise principles, you know, that we, we capture our knowledge, we build on that knowledge, you know, we continuously improve our knowledge. Um, but in product development, that's proven to be a lot more difficult to do um, you know, than in some other areas because most teams don't even think about knowledge capture until they're at the very end of the program. And they might capture them golden nuggets or lessons learned and all that, and they get stuck in a file somewhere on a computer and nobody looks at it again, right? Um, so first of all, the fact that they've captured it so late means they're probably not capturing the most important stuff, the, the experiments they tried that didn't work, the, um, you know, the options that uh, fell out of the system, but that might be valuable for a future team. Uh, they, they're also, uh, you know, not capturing uh, knowledge in an easily reusable form because they usually capture it as one giant document, and you know, so you know, it goes filed in a lessons learned, you know, folder along with all the other lessons learned documents from all the other programs. And there's almost not, like there's no index to it really. It's really hard to figure out how to get in there and get useful stuff out. So with rapid learning cycles, we're capturing that knowledge at the end of every phase. And then it's immediately available to other teams. I draw this picture this way intentionally. It's not serial. You have a project that started, and it's immediately developing knowledge that can be injected into other programs uh, that are running uh, that start just a little bit behind. And those programs can go off and learn other things. Um, this this uh, program uh, can close knowledge gaps around one area of technology um, so that the other program can focus on a different area of technology and push the boundaries in a different way. And when we, when we do that, um, these are the results that we see. This is not uh, from me. This is from uh, reports that uh, people have given at conferences where they've talked about using rapid learning cycles. Um, they've done that at lean conferences. They've done it at innovation conferences. You know, that, that these are the results that they see. And the thing, you know, I'm not going to read this list to you. You've probably already read it. Um, and I just want to point out that for me, one of the most gratifying or one of the, the best uh, results that I love to see is I love to see when business unit partners have increased confidence in R&D's ability to deliver. That if we um, set them on this mission uh, to help grow our business in a specific way, that they will be, they will do it, and they will deliver something on time that is what we expect that our customers will love, and um, and 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 they are able to do that. They build that confidence because they're hearing much less in the way of bad news about their products. They don't hear nearly as much of, oh, we're three months from launch and, you know, the production pilot line is down and we don't know when it's going to get back up. And uh, they, they hear much, much less of that. And so that, that really increases their confidence in R&D. Um, as far as actual statistics go, um, you know, it's interesting for a client today, actually, I put together a, a list of uh, the different projects that were on it and some of the results that we've seen. And, um, you know, we're, um, you know, for the groups that are far enough along that they actually have programs that are all the way out of product development now, you know, based on this, you know, we're seeing some pretty significant reductions to market, 30%, 50%, uh, you know, in increases in time to market just from, or reductions rather in time to market just from, from using this. And a lot of that's coming from the fact that they are doing much, much less firefighting in later development, which is also the expensive part of development. So what they may be doing is spending more time in early development, learning, and to um, you know build up their knowledge. But then they are demonstrating that they're spending less time in late development. Um, and of course, being more predictable in product development also has a lot of value because uh, your your partners are better prepared to support you in effectively launching the product. So um, now I want to talk a little bit about how I got here from Lean um, because. Um, you know, this is a conference on lean product development, and yet today when I talk to clients, um, I, I'm using lean less and less. And I'm using lean even though I'm doing lean more and more. So I'm, I'm talking about it less, but I'm doing it more. And, and so I thought it would be interesting for this group uh, if I just kind of walked a little bit about that happened, because that may uh, be reflective of some challenges that some of you have in your own organizations in moving lean into product development. So this picture is the um, LPA practices ladder, uh, you know, from approximately 2008. 
uh, this is what I used to do. I used to go into organizations and I would say, these are the practices of lean product development. And, um, and then I would help them do these practices. I would teach them classes in Lambda. We'd work together on A3 report writing. Um, I would work with them on uh, some things around design for lean. So, you know, they were improving the quality of their architecture. I'd work with them on some set-based thinking uh, stuff, you know, and, and we talk about the role of the chief engineer. And, and I would do those things. And um, in, in many cases, you know, a group, I would come in and do some training and it would really have some difficulty getting traction. Um, sometimes we got active resistance. People would say, well, um, leads to the manufacturing organization, it's not for us. Um, sometimes I would go after a person that uh, did not understand that distinction and had led them astray a little bit in terms of having them do some things that weren't helpful. Um, and so, uh, you know, so I, I didn't see a lot of stickiness. I didn't see that we were creating nearly as much sustainable change. Um, as I was looking for, and you know, I'm, I'm, that's what I'm in this for. You know, I'm in this to improve product development. So, you know, I wanted to kind of see what what was going on and try to figure out what was behind the scenes. So, um, in 2010, I got a series of three projects that ran pretty much in parallel, and all of these programs had the same problem. They were trying to figure out how do we use lean principles in the front end of product development. They were in organizations that had a strong lean commitment. So they had already done a lot in lean manufacturing, a lot in lean office. You know, some of them saw product development as the final frontier. And some of them, um, some of them started, you know, just saw that their manufacturing organization would work a lot better if they could work with um, product development in a leaner way. And so, um, and so I got these three projects at the same time. And the Rapid Learning Cycles framework emerged from all of this work. Rapid Learning Cycles itself was first mentioned in a little tiny book by Dr. Ellen Ward called the LPD Skills Book. He, he printed it in 2004. He released it mostly to his clients. There are a few copies of it still floating around. And, um, but Ellen was a mechanical engineer and a mechanical engineering professor. And um, I don't think he had a lot of exposure to the work that was being done in the agile software community around managing um, high uncertainty. And um, so in about 2010, you know, we were looking at ways to work with the front end of product development and decided to use some agile project management methods uh, for dealing with this uncertainty. Really, really get into what is a learning cycle and then how do you manage a cycle of learning? Well, this is something that agile development had been working on for a very long time. They have some well documented, well understood best practices for managing a program that was going to be run in cycles instead of linearly. And so we incorporated agile development um, into the Rapid Learning Cycles framework. And, 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 um, and so the way that I describe this is that um, the Rapid Learning Cycles framework is a synthesis of the lean product development practices that did deliver results when they were sticky. And by that I mean that if I could get groups to run A3s and use Lambda to solve their problems, and if I could get groups to use visual management, to, um, to run their programs um, more visually, um, that we would see that they were capturing reusable knowledge, they were getting better results, okay? Um, with Agile, uh, the project management layered on top of that, we really figured out, okay, this is how we can structure that whole idea around learning early. This is how we can pull learning forward in a way that's gonna make sense for development teams. Along the way, you know, we, as we've been evolving this framework over the last five, six years, we've incorporated some other ideas that have strengthened it. Um, one of those main ideas was actually taken from the Lean Startup. Uh, you know, Eric Ries and Steve Blank's work uh, around startups uh, and their concept that every product is really a hypothesis that you can't really prove until you've actually sold it to somebody and gotten their feedback on it. And so in their world, where they're working with largely IT and software projects, you know, you develop a minimum viable product, you know, the, the, the smallest thing you can deliver to a customer that they would actually pay for, and then get it out there. Get it out there fast, get it out there, you know, don't worry so much about quality, don't worry so much about uh, sustainability or scalability, just get something out there, and then start learning uh, from your customer. Okay, well that approach works really well in software and IT. It doesn't necessarily work so well if you're making something that um, 
is tangible, you know, something that has to obey the laws of physics. You know, my, the teams I work with, you know, if they make a decision about, um, you know, which material they're going to use uh, for a given component, you know, that decision's got a very long lifespan and is not easy to change. And so it's not something they're going to experiment with on their customers. You know, and some of these are working in uh, areas where, um, like aerospace, where, you know, they're not going to do anything that is not risky um, because, you know, people's lives are at stake. So, um, so that, you know, the, the minimum viable product idea doesn't necessarily translate all that well, but what does translate is the idea that, um, that the, the thing that we think about a product is essentially a hypothesis that we have to go validate, that, and every product is, is that hypothesis. Um, design thinking encourages us to think much, much more about customer needs, um, go out into the customer environment, really understand what's going on there as a way of increasing our ability to deliver customer value. And then um, because we're thinking so much about extensible knowledge, about knowledge that we intend to use not just once but many times, it kind of naturally leads us to think about how do we do that in the context of platform and product families. So we start thinking about things like cadenced releases where, okay, even if we don't have a natural annual market window for a product, we create one. You know, we find a way to create a regular pull to drive us to release new products to the market um, so that we can, you know, uh, get, uh, get them out there, begin learning from our customers, um, you know, and then feed that information back into future products. So, um, so just to highlight here, the lean product development practices that are proven to deliver results. Um, a parallel line to this research was to kind of dig in and say, well, what is it about lean that's giving us a lot of resistance? You know, what is it about, um, about lean that is uh, hard to communicate? And, you know, one of the things that emerged in that work is that um, a lot of the people we were working with in um, the innovation space especially, um, they, they didn't, it's almost like they didn't even hear the language of lean. Um, that when we talk to them about problems, they're focused on how do I get this thing out? You know, how, how do I get this out as fast as possible? You know, we would talk to them about eliminating waste and they were like, well, I want to focus on creating value. And, and so um, what, part of this too was learning how to talk to people in ways that, that made more sense to them. At the same time, uh, well, okay, so this slide shows uh, the groups that I was working with around lean product development. Um, what often, I would teach them these three things. I would teach them Lambda, I would teach them about A3s, I'd teach them about visual project management, and a little bit about the Nimawashi process of making decisions with A3s. And they would get that far, and then they wouldn't really ever go above that. Um, they might experiment a little bit with set base, but they'd usually give up on it, you know, that kind of thing. Um, they wouldn't really get um, all that far. And I think that part of that has to do with that communication thing that I was talking about. Um, so this picture here shows the orientation of, um, you know, starting with problems, defects, warranty claims, production problems, versus innovation, um, ship product, happy customers, organic growth. Now, the thing is that in product development, there is not a single product developer that wants to have problems, that wants to have all these issues. And there's not a single uh, person in product development that doesn't want innovation, that doesn't want happy customers, that doesn't want to see their company grow. It's more fun to work for a company that's growing. Now, the difference is in orientation. Okay, so um, the people that we found that did resonate with Lean, the people that did, you know, their faces would light up when we did the training, and they, we would see that they'd actually been trying some of the stuff when we went back. You know, they had the orientation you kind of see on the bottom. You know, that it's like the, the language of Lean helped them identify what they wanted to move away from, and, and that was motivating for them. But we also found that a lot of the people we really needed uh, the technical leaders in the organization, the people that were known for being innovative, uh, didn't resonate with that message at all. And that's because their orientation was much more about, um, how do I get this product out the door? You know, I've got this really cool idea, I wanna see it come to life. And um, you know, one of the things we learned in our research as we got further and further into this is that um, you know, there, there's some uh, academic studies that show that a person with um, you know, that kind of positive um, I don't say positive, that's not the right word, but a person who is focused on getting towards something um, is not even gonna hear um, all the work around problems. And I don't remember how many times a lean leader in product development has said, we needed to create a, a culture of problem solving. 
And um, the research shows that for the people who were our target audience, a problem-solving culture was literally hell. It was not what they wanted to do. Um, and, and, and so we have to think about, and what we had to do was step up and say, okay, are we really concerned with using the right words with these people? Are we really concerned with you know, the right message? Or are we concerned about what they do? Because a person who is focused on eliminating the obstacles that's going to get between them and the ship product, and a person who's solving the problems that are, you know, um, that are, you know, uh, uh, coming up, you know, as they develop a new product, are actually doing exactly the same thing. They're just thinking about it from two different perspectives. And so uh, we've learned that we're much more effective when, and that our work is much stickier when we focus on using the language that is going to resonate more with the people that we're working with. So um, lean alone is not sticky because the lean focus is much more on the problems. And, um, and the innovators are going to tend to focus much more on the future state, the, the solutions, right? Um, and so um, what we do is by adding in Agile and by adopting much more of Agile's language, um, Agile is focused very much on shipping stuff. Um, in the purest forms of Agile, every cycle results in shippable software, something that you could, simp you could release to a customer today if you, if you needed to. Um, we can't really do that in hardware. What we can do is kind of have that emphasis on every cycle is getting us closer to this finished product. Every cycle is getting closer to bringing this innovation to life and really using that language to help improve their motivation. And when we do that, we find that it's a lot stickier. So um, by doing that, we're keeping the, the focus much more where most of the population is. Um, we're helping them really see that um, this method is going to help them get what they want. All right? And, and we do have very, very high stickiness for rapid learning cycles. So I went back and looked over my client list uh, recently, and the clients that I had in... Um, you know, from about 2006 to about 2010, I was still in contact with some of them. Uh, some of them had gone on two rapid learning cycles. Um, others had continued on their lean journey. But a lot of the people that I had worked with um, were just, uh, were not doing lean. They were not doing lean because they lost momentum. They were not doing lean because they had a management change, um, you know, for, for whatever reason. Um, the Rapid Learning Cycles program, though, the very, the very first three companies that developed the framework are still using Rapid Learning Cycles today, even though the framework itself has changed. Even though I would go back in time, I would say, well, you know, what we did for those first three were just not very good, um, wasn't very consistent in delivering results, you know. Um, it was still, there was enough promise there, and they could see that um, enough about, you know, the future, that, uh, that they've stuck with it anyway. And in fact, they've helped us. They've helped us improve it. They've helped us grow and change it. Um, until it delivers repeatable results. Um, and every company that has given rapid learning cycles an honest try is still using it uh, today. And I could never, never say that about my work with Lean. So um, some of the agile practices that have helped contribute to this, one is delivering knowledge in short, continuous cycles is a really, really key one. Um, another is managing a regular cadence to manage a regular work. That's been a huge one. Uh, in fact, more and more we appreciate the value of maintaining that rhythm. Um, another one is capturing uh, knowledge in real time. Uh, so at the end of every uh, one of these cycles, they produce a report that goes in a knowledge library. These reports are A3s. Uh, they don't take that long to produce, but they're helping the organization capture knowledge in real time. And when we do that, uh, when we incorporate these Agile processes into the product development process, we get lean. Uh, we get Lambda visible knowledge management by proposal. We get visible rhythmic processes that create pull and flow. All right? And um, <clears throat> we also uh, begin creating the structures for value-driven architecture through the emphasis on extensible knowledge and set-based design through the, the fact that they can make, um, they can structure set-based in the concept of learning uh, cycles, and the chief engineer um, in the sense that uh, the person who's really helping to pull the two together and lead a program with rapid learning cycles is a, a team that is, um, is prepared to do this, to really prepare to, to do all of these things. 
So um, at the same time, it's important to know that not all of the assumptions apply of, of Agile. Uh, the main difference there, if you look at this list of things, uh, has to do with the fact that uh, software is virtual uh, and, and doesn't have to obey the laws of physics, and tangible products do. So, um, Catherine, I just wanted to give you a heads up that we're about to wrap up okay. here. Yeah, I did. Get, uh, yeah, I'm seeing that. Okay, and, yeah. and then I talked earlier about some of these other things that we incorporated into the framework that also create pull for the chief engineer for set-based design and for value-driven architecture. Um, a lot of the work, especially around platform management, really encourages um, those things. So my suggestion is, is that if Lean is important to you, um, that you use rapid learning cycles to drive Lean product development. In fact, the client that I'm at here in France, they're doing exactly that. Uh, they struggled for two years to implement Lean, Lean and R&D, and then we've been working with them on rapid learning cycles for about six months, and they're here. I mean, every, the teams, you know, by every metric that they've used to measure Lean um, in their organization, they've made some pretty dramatic improvements. Um, if your R&D teams are allergic to Lean, um, you can give them my book, the second book. Uh, it barely mentions Lean. <laughs> and um, you can use that to drive the behaviors you want to drive, uh, Lean product development, without using um, the language of problem solving and eliminating defects and things that tends to create unnecessary resistance. Okay. So uh, just a little bit more about me and where I am. And so that's my presentation. Thank you. Allergic to lean. I like that, Catherine. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and perhaps we all need to come over and see this facility in France then. It sounds like a uh, make for a trip. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so Catherine, thank you very much. And I think we're going to hear from you later on uh, on the panel discussion. Uh, we did have a couple of questions come in. So okay. we can perhaps hold those off until that, that time. Okay. So thank you very That's much. Okay, thank you.